Let me tell you about a story you may have heard before. Come on along with me. When the early settlers of New England were threatened by Native American Indians, they decided to establish a militia to protect their interests in the New World. So in December of 1636, the word went out to all able-bodied citizens and males ages 16 to 60 in the town of Salem, Massachusetts to form three regiments of volunteers to drill and prepare for attacks. Now these citizen soldiers, the forerunners of today's National Guard, came together four months later on Salem Common in what we know as the first muster. Now the idea of citizen soldiers stretched out across the colonies. So in April of 1775, a brave band of militiamen stood their ground at the Old North Bridge in Concord, Massachusetts to fight off the British who were coming to take their arms and ammunition, what we know as the shot heard around the world. But it didn't stop there. Just as the rebels' fortunes began to wane at the hands of the powerful, more professional British forces, citizen soldiers utilized unusual tactics at a small cow pasture in South Carolina and beat the Redcoats at their own game in what we know as the Battle of Cowpens. A few months later, at the Battle of Yorktown, again, it was the citizen soldiers that helped to win that battle and the surrender of the British forces and the birth of a new nation. However, that nation was threatened by a protest of farmers known as the Whiskey Rebellion in 1794. That rebellion threatened the new nation, but again, it was the citizen soldiers that came to the aid of America and helped save the nation. Right here, 1794. Now, later, War of 1812, it was again citizen soldiers who fought a specific battle outside Baltimore Harbor, inspiring a DC militiaman, Francis Scott Key, to pen the words to what we know as the national anthem. As the nation grew, so did its citizen soldiers who traveled thousands of miles as war broke out in the Rio Grande country of Texas in the 1840s. With victory in the Mexican War, the country now stretched from the Atlantic to the Pacific. But by 1861, the country was at war with itself. Southern states seceded and utilized their citizen soldiers, as did the North, to wage war upon one another. Through this civil war, the Union, with its militia, would persevere. Now, the country then moved westward with the construction of a national railroad, creating vast settlements along the way. Again, it was the National Guard, as it was becoming known then, that was there to aid the journey and provide necessary protection. In response to a destroyed American warship in Cuba, the U.S. went to war with Spain in 1898. A former New York militia officer and future President of the United States would make a charge up San Juan Hill and open the door to American leadership in the 20th century. But when Mexican General Pancho Villa raided Columbus, New Mexico in 1916, an unprecedented call for the National Guard to protect the Mexican border went out. It was the Guard's first national call to action in defense of the homeland and would serve as a tune-up for a larger conflict far away from the U.S. because a global war now threatened Europe and forced U.S. involvement in 1917. With large-scale training accomplished on the Mexican border, the National Guard proved critical to the success that America provided its European allies. They defeated Germany and the Central Powers by late 1918 in what was known as the Great War. A victory in World War I enabled the country to enjoy a triumphant moment. However, it also marked a decline in the effectiveness of the National Guard. The nation chose a more isolationist policy toward the world and drew down its military force. However, dark clouds were brewing both at home and abroad. After Europe fell to the Nazi war machine, the United States awoke from its slumber. The National Guard needed to be energized through large-scale training maneuvers, which it did in the South. Now, although the majority of World War II was fought on foreign soil, a key Allied victory took place in the Aleutian Islands of Alaska. Citizen soldiers from Arkansas fought off a Japanese aerial attack at Dutch Harbor. And when the time came to invade Europe, the Guard was there in the blood and the mud on the beaches of Normandy, in what we now know as D-Day. Now, less than five years after that, the National Guard played a large part in a limited war when President Harry S. Truman called out the Guard to augment the troops during the Korean War. Now, Barinconiers from Puerto Rico, among other units, acquitted themselves with valor and courage during that engagement. Then the U.S. entered into another war by the 1960s, and although the Guard itself didn't enter into it until 1968, they provided a lot of support to the active duty Army and Air Force. And although the last half of the 20th century saw a number of hot spots, the world was also concerned with the Cold War with the Soviet Union, which got a lot hotter when they built the Berlin Wall in 1961. President John F. Kennedy called out the entire Air National Guard at the time in support. 
And when that wall came down almost 30 years later, the Guard was there as well to help support Germany during its unification. With the focus away from the Cold War, the U.S. found itself defending an ally in the Middle East when Iraq invaded Kuwait in 1990. The National Guard was mobilized and played a key role in Operation Desert Storm. Just 10 years later, the United States suffered its worst terrorist attack. One terrorist commandeered four jetliners, flew them into the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, and an aborted attempt in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. America was under attack, and the National Guard provided the first military organization both on the ground and in the air in New York City. And to this day, the Air National Guard flies combat air patrols over New York and Washington. In late 2001, the U.S. responded with a multi-phase force to Southwest Asia to root out the terrorists. Operation Enduring Freedom saw Guard units in support of the global war on terrorism. Now, the war on terrorism continued in 2003 as President George W. Bush sought to stabilize the Middle East and to keep the terrorists from expanding their base of operations. Now, Operation Iraqi Freedom saw an expansion and it saw the National Guard provide almost 50% of the boots on the ground during that operation. The new millennium brought with it a new distinction for the National Guard, from strategic reserve to operational force. Citizen soldiers were also called upon for an unprecedented amount of domestic emissions all across the U.S., just as they had in 1636. Now, Hurricane Katrina flooded almost all of New Orleans and devastated the Gulf Coast, requiring the assistance of the National Guard from all 50 states, three territories, and the District of Columbia. It was the largest relief operation in human history. Thousands of lives were saved. Less than a year later, President Bush called upon the National Guard again to help federal agencies protect the U.S.-Mexico border. Thousands of citizen soldiers and airmen were called up for Operation Jumpstart, just as thousands of National Guardsmen are on duty all around the world today. The National Guard continues in that role to this very day. Just as the citizen soldier of 1636 became a necessity to their community, the National Guardsmen of today is every bit as relevant, ready, and reliable. The National Guard members provide a unique blend of civilian and military skills, from critical combat mission support to agribusiness development teams to a state partnership program that spans the globe. Domestically, the Guard provides assistance to civilian authorities through hazards response team package that is geographically positioned for swift response. As a dual missioned operational force requiring only a small portion of defense funds, the Guard can provide a solution to today's challenges. Bottom line, it's your National Guard, always ready, always there, adding value to America every day.